The Evenings with Genetics series is sponsored by the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine and the Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas. During the webinar, you can enter questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer as many as possible. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website. Tonight, speakers are Dr. Steve Shira and Dr. Wayne Nicholson, and I will introduce both and they will then uh, give you presentations. Dr. Shira is a professor in the Human Genome Sequencing Center and Department of Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine. He has served in numerous roles, helping to build the center as one of five major international sites tasked with the Human Genome Project, including its director of mapping. He's gone on to collaborate with multiple scientists locally, nationally, and internationally to introduce DNA sequencing technologies to various fields of biomedical research. For the past 10 years, Dr. Shira has directed the center's efforts in pharmacogenomics. Okay. Um, first off, uh, many thanks to uh, Dr. Murray, to Susan Fernbach, to the department at uh, the genetics department at Baylor College of Medicine, and of course, uh, to Dr. Nicholson for help in doing the, the presentation this evening. Um, in that this is a historically a presentation that's given to the general public. I'm going to start with some pretty uh, simple review, if you will. So those of you in the audience who have a uh, more advanced background, uh, please indulge me and um, we'll get into the meat of it here in uh, a few minutes. One of the, the disadvantages, of course, I would love to be doing this live. Um, and the disadvantage of Zoom is that I can't use my hands to, to um, demonstrate concepts or anything, but it does give us the opportunity to uh, have Dick, uh, Dr. Nicholson uh, from Rochester, Minnesota here to uh, help do, do this presentation. So um, we're gonna start off with uh, the central dogma, and that is the fact that, um, that cells, um, the, the, the human body is made up of, of billions of cells. And every one of those cells has a nucleus that's jam packed with DNA, uh, with the exception of red blood cells. Um, that DNA is packed into the nucleus and um, at points uh, during its lifetime, of course, it uh, then transcribes that code of DNA into a single Strand, stranded molecule called RNA. That RNA then is trans, is uh, um, exits the nucleus into the cytoplasm and then undergoes translation in order to form proteins. It does this by the fact that each three bases codes for a particular amino acid and ribosomes then read out that three base code and basically grow the amino acid chain. So what does DNA look like? DNA is double-stranded. Um, it, it actually, uh, each strand moves in, is oriented in an opposite direction. In the middle of that, those, that double strand are the bases themselves. And we simply um, abbreviate the base names with letters. C always bonds to a G and A always bonds to a T. And it, you can also denote this like a ladder, as you see here, uh, or, and in fact, what happens then is this twists into what's called the double helix. And there happens to be about 6 billion nucleotides in each human genome that these in are then arranged in 23 pairs of chromosomes, 22 autosomes and two sex chromosomes. Of course, uh, males have a Y chromosome along with one X, whereas females have two X chromosomes. If you were to take all the DNA within a nucleus and string it out, it would basically amount to something that's about six feet long. So, Then what's a gene? So genes in general are made up of, of basically two components, 
it's still this double-stranded string of bases, but um, they're broken up into what are called exons and introns. The exons actually code for proteins. The introns sort of interrupt that code, if you will. So when DNA is copied into RNA, the introns are spliced out and the exons are spliced together before it exits, exits the nucleus as what's called messenger RNA. Um, you can get more than one protein out of a single gene by what's called alternative splicing. In other words, occasionally a exon may in fact be spliced out as well. So now you've coded for something that's a bit different and therefore a different protein. So the genome is a collection of all an organism's genes and it encodes every protein that that organism will ever make throughout its lifetime. The Human Genome Project was initiated back in the 1990s, and we were one of the five major genome centers that was tasked with basically doing that project. The outcome of that project was what's called the Human Genome Reference. And that reference is constantly being updated. Its current version is some big long thing called GRCH38, but that's not particularly important. What is important is that that reference is used to basically understand human variation at the DNA level. So over time, the cost of sequencing a genome has declined something like a million fold over the last 20 years from the time that the Human Genome Project's draft sequence was published to the present day. That's allowed us to undertake a whole lot of, of interesting things that we heck, didn't even dream about. Um, 20 years ago. So one of the concepts that we've come to understand is the fact that if you compare two humans to each other, we're 99.9% .9 identical. But if you multiply 0 0.01 times 6 billion bases, that's still a fair amount of variation between individuals. And that variation can take on uh, numerous forms. The most common variation that occurs about every 300 bases or so are something called single nucleotide variants or single nucleotide polymorphisms. And these things are abbreviated as SNPs. You can also have inserted bases. You can have deleted bases. And remember in the code, that was a three base code for every amino acid. So if you insert two bases, you have now messed up the register. And you have, of course, now created something that um, probably isn't going to work right. On a grander scale, we have something called structural variation, where you can have large deletions or large insertions, or in fact, inversions, where you take a bit of DNA and flip it around, or duplications, where you take a whole region of the DNA, make another copy of it, and that gets, back, gets inserted back into a chromosome. So some further terms to define. Uh, one word that you may hear and that I'll present in this talk are things called alleles. These, are, these can be either single bases. Um, you can, for instance, think of this by the fact that you of course have two copies of every gene, one that's inherited from your mother, one that's inherited from your father. Um, those copies can be identical in which case the alleles are said to be identical, or um, they can be somewhat different. Um, you can think of these as versions. Another word for allele we may, may be versions. Um, if you get down to the single nucleotide level, um, if you have exactly the same base in the two copies, um, they are known as being homozygous. If they differ between each other, between the two copies, uh, they're, they're called heterozygous. One of the ways of assaying a genome is called genotyping. And this is in fact a sampling of the genome. It's generally done at millions of variant sites, at the SNP sites. Um, and therefore these assays are dependent upon actually knowing that those SNPs are, are there in the first place. Sequencing on the other hand, um, doesn't assume anything. We simply read out the entire genome. So the conundrum is, for this talk, most medicines are conceived and marketed 
to and for the average human. But of course, we all know we're not average. In fact, we're all above average, especially in Minnesota, right? Right, Nate? Oops, sorry. So pharmacogenomics, big long word, uh, sometimes abbreviated as PGX. Basically, it means medicines and your DNA. How does one's genetic profile influence drug efficacy and or toxicity? Um, and what we're talking about here with regards to drugs is, are their absorption, their distribution, their metabolism, and their excretion. So why is this such a big deal? Well, we uh, end up taking a lot of drugs. 49% of the U.S. population takes at least one medication. The, these data are from the CDC from 2017. 12% take five or more medications. There's nearly three, or three quarters of a million adverse reactions, uh, emergency room visits per year, and about 120,000 hospitalizations per year, which um, is a big financial burden on the healthcare system. So why pharmacogenomics? Well, this is generally seen as a logical first tier for personalizing medicine and delivering precision medicine, because as we've just talked about, one size does not fit all. Testing is feasible and has lifelong value. You only have to be tested once. Multiple studies have shown that greater than 90% of individuals harbor at least one clinically actionable pharmacogenomic variant. In fact, the number is actually higher than that. And the public is interested. And um, based on polls that were done ahead of a project that I'll talk about at the very end of this talk, um, maybe more interested in that than they are in things like ancestry or genetic traits. So with regards to clinical imp implementation, there is a group called CPIC. And um, the letters, of course, stand for the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium. Um, currently, there are 22 genes um, that have clinical guidelines that cover 82 drugs. And some examples of those are drugs like the NSAIDs or uh, non-steroidal um, uh, uh, anyway, ibuprofen and aspirin, among others, um, SSRIs and other antidepressant classes, proton pump inhibitors for um, um, uh, GERD, things like Nexium and Prilosec and others. And CPIC is run by the three individuals you see up here at the top. Um, they basically then list uh, off and pre pre <laughs> present guidelines for various drug gene combinations. Um, basically what happens here is that various alleles are used to predict uh, metabolizer status and are grouped into generally five categories, poor metabolizers, intermediate metabolizers, normal metabolizers, rapid metabolizers, and ultra rapid metabolizers. And so for an example of how this works, um, I'm going to bring up the case of clopridogrel. Clopridogrel is uh, better known by its trade name of Plavix. Um, it was back in 2007, the second most widely prescribed drug. It's now in 40th place. It's uh, sold uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, drugs to the public. Um, but it is in fact a pro-drug and requires activation by the body. So if we go into what's called farm GKB, and each of these can be searched for and looked up on the web, uh, farm GKB is the pharmacogenomics knowledge base. It's, it's the database. And basically there you can find um, categories and look at things like um, annotated drugs. And if we go look up clopridogrel, well, you can basically find that there are at least seven uh, publications on prescribing information. There are five drug labels worldwide uh, with regards to this medication. And if we go further and look at the curated pathways, we can understand um, how it is that clopridogrel 
is processed by the body. So it is in fact absorbed into the bloodstream from the small intestine and it's transported in the bloodstream by a transporter that, go, that goes by the name of ABCB1 um, to the liver. And then the liver, it's processed by multiple enzymes, but the primary one is something called CYP2C19. And CYP2C19 then cleaves off a portion of the prodrug, making it active. It's released back into the bloodstream and goes to bind a receptor on platelets to prevent uh, blood clotting. So this drug is primarily prescribed to those to cardiac patients, to stroke patients, to prevent clotting. And the whole idea behind this is that, um, is that, for instance, a physician may come into a patient's room after uh, implanting a stent, for instance, uh, looks at the vital signs, sees that things look good, goes to write a prescription. And potentially it's an alert that says, uh-uh, not for this guy. That would be based on the following. There's an FDA label uh, on clopridogrel that warns of people who in fact are classified as poor metabolizers. And so if we go look at those clinical guidelines and scroll down to the bottom, we can see that the poor metabolizers uh, carry two loss of function alleles and for instance, these alleles are labeled in pharmacogenomics speak as star two or star three. If you have two copies of these, in other words, you're homozygous uh, for star two or heterozygous and have both star two and star three or homozygous for star three, um, you are classified as that more poor metabolizer. And it is suggested that you get some other drug instead of clopridogrel. Uh, star twos are um, basically SNPs that are involved in RNA splicing. So you get misplicing. And star threes are SNPs that create a premature stop codon. Those three base codes I talked about before not only code for amino acids, they also code for the stop signal that, that uh, basically says translation ought to end here. So one of the primary challenges in, in this field is dealing with a enzyme and its gene called CYP2D6. CYP2D6 is involved in 25% of, of drug metabolism for all the drugs out there. Um, and it is a complicated gene. It sits on chromosome 22. Um, it's has a lot of different variants even within the gene itself. In fact, it already has 140 defined star alleles and it's prone to structural variation. So some examples of this are presented here. In uh, line one is what the gene generally looks like. There's CYP2D6 and downstream of it are two what are called pseudogenes. CYP2D7 and CYP2D8. These two genes are copies of 2D6 that occurred a long time ago and have accumulated mutations that make them inactive. However, they're still sitting there. And so they can undergo recombination um, and deletion and all sorts of things that make this a very difficult locus. So for instance, in line two, there's a deletion here that kind of spans this region where these two are then put together and you form a hybrid gene, or you can get the hybrid gene and a, a copy of the good gene, or you can get two copies of the good gene. Now, CYP2D6 is, one, is the primary uh, gene involved in processing codeine. Codeine is also a prodrug. It needs to be processed in order to form morphine, which is the pain reliever. So, if you have this situation or a complete deletion of CYP2D6, you are known as a poor metabolizer and prescribing codeine probably isn't gonna provide very much in the way of pain relief. If on the other hand, you have multiple copies of CYP2D6 and individuals have been found to have as many as 13 copies of this gene, 
you become what's called an ultra rapid metabolizer, which basically means that there's the possibility that um, you process uh, coding way too fast and your system gets a jolt that it's uh, maybe not cut out to uh, handle. This is especially dangerous within children. You can also get uh, situations where you've got uh, you know, multiple copies of the hybrid gene, but in this case, you've had an inversion. Or um, you can get uh, a good copy of the gene, uh, you know, a regular copy of the pseudogene 2D7 along with this hybrid. In other words, it's a difficult gene to get through. That said, it's important that it be assayed and uh, a part of of pharmacogenomics moving forward. So what we want to what I want to highlight here is a, a recent project that we undertook with the Mayo Clinic uh, called the Right 10K project. This is part of of the Right um, study out of out of the Mayo Clinic, which stands for Right Drug, Right Dose, Right Time, using genomic data to individualize treatment. So for this particular study. Um, 10,000 individuals were recruited. These were volunteers that received their primary care at the Mayo Clinic, and their DNA was isolated from blood and biobanked at the Mayo Clinic. In the meantime, at Baylor here, we created a sequencing panel that targets 77 pharmacogenomics genes, and uh, the Mayo Clinic uh, sent us the DNA. We did uh, sequencing using that sequencing panel and return the results for 13 genes affecting 23 drugs for which um, there are potential alerts that fire at the Mayo Clinic and incorporated that information into the electronic health record for those 10,000 individuals. We also return the results uh, to the study participants. So these are the 13 genes that were returned. And what happened with this was that uh, we at Baylor did allele calls and predicted metabolizer phenotypes for all of the targets except 2D6. The Mayo Clinic developed software based on a large group of SNP sites within 2D6 and um, used that to predict metabolizer phenotypes. That software was so effective that at the beginning of the project, it was estimated that the Mayo would have to do manual review of uh, five to 7% of the samples, but in fact, only about 1%, in fact, a little less than 1% of the samples actually needed manual review. Current studies uh, are aimed at uh, further developing and uh, investigating that raw data, uh, following patient outcomes in terms of understanding whether this information in, uh, results in better efficacy and less in the way of, of any adverse events, and um, trying to understand whether healthcare economics uh, look better at the, in, at the end of the day, and we believe they will. So this effort, of course, required a whole lot of work um, with regards to informatics pipelines at both institutions in order to get from DNA all the way to results in the EHR. So general takeaways from the project, the vast majority of individuals carry three to four clinically actionable pharmacogenomics variants. Less than 1% carry none. In other words, this can help just about everybody. On average, everyone carries another seven rare variants that are predicted by algorithms to be deleterious. And because we're using sequencing and not genotyping, these would never be seen by genotyping. The smoothest way of doing this is to, is to basically come up with this data um, prospectively. In other words, have the data present in the electronic health record ahead of prescription writing. Because you can imagine that if somebody went, goes, wants to write a prescription for a drug for which there may be FDA warnings, for instance, to then send that out for testing and get results back is not the most efficient way to practice medicine. 
and it needs to be expanded to more diverse populations. Now, these 10,000 individuals that we looked at were overwhelmingly white, but this is Southern Minnesota, and um, that's, that's what the population is there. Impediments to further implementation clinically in the US, it's insurance and Medicare reimbursement. We're finally to, beginning to see some traction there. Insurance companies are, are beginning to take this up and uh, it, it's not widespread yet, but it's getting there. There are some CMS subcontractors who have recently begun to reimburse uh, for this kind of testing. Um, hopefully that wave just gets bigger and uh, this begins to roll out in a bigger way. The other uh, major impediment is education. Uh, for both healthcare providers and the general public. And by providers, I mean doctors, nurse practitioners, genetic counselors, um, physician's assistants, the whole, the whole nine yards. So if you're interested in having your genome sequenced um, and potentially getting at least a little bit of information on your pharma, potential pharmacogenomics profile, you may be interested in an NIH project called All of Us. Um, they're aiming to recruit about a million people. Um, so far, they're at about 335,000. The aim is to get 80% of these participants from underrepresented in biomedical research communities. This is a big deal in pharmacogenomics because to this point, um, a whole lot of the data that these models, et cetera, are built on are built from Northern European populations. And uh, we need to get a whole lot broader. Um, th this particular project has a modest pharmacogenomics component to it. It's looking at seven genes. And if you end up um, uh, getting your profile back, it's meant to empower you to go talk to your physician to potentially talk about doing uh, clinical pharmacogenomic sequencing. If you're interested, you can do a, uh, a search on all of us or go to the website that you see here. So I'd like to uh, basically turn it over to Nick, but before I do so, I need to thank uh, the folks in my group at the Human Genome Sequencing Center that's Richard Gibbs, uh, our director, Eric Borowinkle, our co-director, Donna Musney, uh, pictured here on the left, uh, who's our director of operations, Zhang Chin, who's my right-hand man with regards to analysis and, and helped out big time with this, with, uh, this project. Um, at the Mayo Clinic, uh, Dr. Dick Winchelbaum uh, was the primary driver for this, for this project uh, and ably assisted by Li Wei Wang and Dr. John Black, who uh, used to run uh, the uh, Center for Individualized Medicine there. We will be taking questions at the end. If you have questions you're not thinking of now, uh, my email address is, is here.